Hi, this is Phil Spencer, and you're listening to the Inner Circle Podcast. For the fans, by the fans. First, we want to thank you for coming on the show to talk about your new game, New Mod Breath of Life, the first next-gen title to release on Xbox One using Unreal Engine 4, which, by the way, might I add, looks absolutely stunning. But what is New Mod? You know, what is it about? Because for some of us older gamers, it reminds us of Myst, the point-and-click PC adventure, and were you able to draw any inspiration from that game in particular? Um... See, this is the weird thing, because uh, we're all, like, 22 years old, and Mist came out in, I think it was 93. Right. So I, I was, like, one then. Right. So um, I never really got the opportunity to play that game. And we went to, you know, Gamescom, and, and we went to PAX in Seattle, and then all of a sudden we had, you know, 30-year-old gamers coming up to us saying, oh, my God, I love this game. It's just like Mist. I love it. And we were kind of like, oh, what's Mist? We've never even we've never heard of it. <laughs> um and because of that, we've deliberately not played Mist. We haven't watched videos. The only thing we've done is like read the Wikipedia page on it, nice. and um, we all agreed not to look into it so we don't you know, steal anything from it subconsciously. Right. But I think it was never a bad thing that we're similar to Mist because whenever we, people tell us, "Oh my God, it's like Mist," they they it's not they don't sound like we're copying it. They just sound emphatically happy that we're making a game that's like that, if you know what I mean, in that style, the same difficulty, and that sort of thing. Because it's not a point and click, but it's a game that you really have to think about and methodically go through. You can't just look your way through. You've got to think about what you're doing. Right. And I think that's what people think they see in it when they compare it to Myst. Right, right. Yeah, you know, we don't get a lot of games like that um, on the Xbox platform, surprisingly. You know, usually when you look at these type of puzzle games, everybody thinks the Xbox platform is, you know, the do bro, <laughs> shoot 'em up type type of thing. So bringing a title like this to the Xbox One, at first is just in itself, you know, a, a really great thing. And Xbox gamers really need to to appreciate some of the indie games that we're starting to to get. And I really hope to see more titles like this on a platform in the future. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um. It's not just Xbox. It's it's you know both Xbox and PlayStation are, are pretty focused on Call of Duty, and I'd say a hefty percentage of both of the consoles. Most of the players are pure Call of Duty or FIFA players, mm. so that's always hard for us to compete with. But there's a there's a big group of people on both consoles that I think want a little bit more out of their console this time around, and slightly better graphics on Call of Duty. Right, and I I think we're a sort of game that's going to give them that because we're looking, you know, I often say to people, you know, uh, that Numa is a game where you kind of have to sit down with a glass of whiskey in front of a fire and play. <laughs> you, you know, you really got to think about it. Right. And you can't just, you can't just chance your way through. And this sort of game has been on PC for a while. It, you know, we've seen Portal and those type of games and this isn't particularly a new, a new genre, but right. it definitely is to, uh, console, so we're kind of hoping that people on console are going to see this amazing genre that they don't really ever get the opportunity to play, and they're going to see how fun playing thought through critical thinking games like Numa can be. Right. So it, it's going to be an interesting few months because we're going to see how many people really want to think about these type of games, and if they, if there really is a market for it. And um, you know, we're coming out on Steam as well, and I think it'll be interesting to compare the sales there, but. 
really, I think Xbox and you know other consoles are, are craving a game like this and need to get some sort of life into them to get some sort of uh, I don't know, intelligent game. Let's say right. I, I completely agree. Some diversity in, in, into the into the game market, definitely. Well, you know. Like I said earlier, the game is absolutely beautiful to look at, um, and you can't help but notice how much detail was put into the world. From the outside environments and weather effects to the architecture of the buildings, the design of the game is meant to help figure out the clues to complete each puzzle. Are, you know, Is there a difficulty option? Because some of the puzzles seem quite difficult, and are you rewarded in any way for completing the most complicated puzzles with items to help figure out other puzzles? Um... It's. I mean, that's. It, it's much more uh, iterative and much more um, of a stepping stone situation. I think it's more like you don't get rewarded for the tougher puzzles because you, I mean, most people who complete the tougher puzzles can get the easier ones. But the most interesting thing is that the people. Sometimes you'll see the people who are completing incredibly hard puzzles also have a really difficult time completing some of the really easy ones. Right. And it's just about how people think. And th there isn't difficulty levels per se, but the game, as you go from chapter one through, I think there's eight chapters, you go through all eight chapters, every time they get a little bit harder and a little bit harder, and we're introducing a new mechanic each chapter, and you're having to learn and remember what you've done in previous chapters, and they all add up together, and I think it's a really good, steady learning curve. And there will be times where players get stuck, and they're just kind of sitting there, staring at an environment, just thinking, what am I going to do here? I <laughs> is it broken when I'm stuck? And I think the hard part is the player where they have to step back and think, okay, what do I need to do? Why am I walking towards this thing? Why is something flashing there? Why is that turning on and off? Right. And we don't give you something physical or give you something in the environment that just tells you, and, you know, gives you the answer. You really have to put two and two together and connect the dots. And I think that's sort of the beauty of puzzle games is that it's not just like, you know, I'll walk, we're not going to walk you through it. You're going to have to do this on your own kind of thing. So, you know, one of the things you notice about the game is all the eyes in the environment, which, you know, obviously is probably what's giving you the clues on what you need yeah. to do next, right, within the game. And uh, and I like that effect, where it's like in some, in some games, even in some adventure games, you might go into a particular area and then this thing is glowing. It is letting you know, hey, come here, move this, grab that. But in, in Numa, I guess the eyes set everything up. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they're the sort of control points. And they're the things that you have to look out for in the game. And we don't really hide the eyes, per se. They're not, they're not hidden away. They're just there to let you know, okay, this is what you, this eye you need to use to get from point A to point B, if you know what I mean. Right. So um, the eyes are, I mean, I, I love the way they look. But I, I think people <laughs> are... are Initially, when we first made them, people often sort of passed them off and thought that the eyes were looking at them. But as you go through, you sort of realize that you're looking at the eyes and you're doing the controlling. And um, I mean, without giving too much away, it, it's a really the whole point of the game is kind of perspective and mm. how you look at the eyes and how you use them. Mm. And there's always I, I always say if if you're doing a puzzle and it seems tedious, then you're doing it wrong. Right. Because there's pretty much two ways to complete every puzzle. There's there's ways that can take you, you know, you know the answer and they'll take you, you know, a minute and a half to complete it. Once you know the answer, you just have to do it and do it and do it. And that's really annoying. But I guarantee you there's a way that takes you 10 seconds to do it. And sometimes you'll see people start doing the really long way to, to complete it. And then they'll, they'll realize, oh, wait, I could just do this. And they understand now the mechanic of the eye and what, why something's moving or why something's opening. And it, I think it's, um, yeah, we get a lot of interesting feedback at conferences uh, from people and how they react to things. I don't think there's one set way for people to react to any puzzle. The ages, ages differ, gender, everything. We get completely different reactions to each puzzle. And that's something really special and interesting about new I think. Right. And, and I mean, another thing about it is that, um, you know, Noom is a game where it can't be experienced in any other medium. Right. It's pretty much only there for video games. And I don't think any other video game can do that. Uh, I don't want to give away the ending, but, you know, if you play, if you manage to make it through the whole thing, you'll realize, like, 
how sort of incredible that feeling is when you can't put this into a film mm. or a book. It has to be played as a video game. Mm. And that's something that no other game does, and I'm sure of that. And I'm really pleased with that, I think. Wow, that's that's exciting. <laughs> I know a lot of gamers are going to be excited to play this game just to get to the end. Um, it, it's definitely going to be something to look out for, guys, and, and definitely something that you're going to need to pick up. Um, you know, DX12 is the new API to help PC game development uh, become similar to console development. But one of the things we learned was that Umbro Engine 4, I guess you could say, kind of works hand in hand with, with DX12. You know, it's kind of like a, a perfect software solution. Um, we only know of a select few who have had access to it. But have you had any experience with DX12 as one of the developers using Unreal Engine 4 with Numa? And was it difficult using Xbox One hardware to build this game? Or did you receive the newer SDKs? Um, I mean, I can't really say a lot about it. Right. But what I can say is, you know, DX12 looks really good and. It's something we'll, we we look into in the future, and we're working on a new game now. And I, I you know I can't say exactly what we're doing, but it, it's definitely something we'll look at. And yeah, I think I mean it works really well with Unreal Engine. Uh, our our team works really well with Unreal Engine. It fits in quite well. Nice. And I don't think we really plan on moving away from them. But um, you know, when we first started making Numa, it was. You know, both on both sides of Epic Games and Xbox One, like you said, we were we were the first people to really, really be developing on Xbox One. Definitely the first indies, anyway. Nice. And um, there was quite a few things going wrong on both sides, and the most amazing thing was that they were there straight away to help us fix it. You know, and you know, their, their forums and their community was amazing, and they they just fixed it straight away. And we were sort of like pathfinders. Um, of uh, Unreal Engine Xbox games, so that was a really cool thing to say we've done. But I think you know the staff at Unreal Engine were really good at just you know fixing things that we we found we need, we had issues with, and it, it was like you know there was times we sort of bang our head against a wall or we're waiting for something or an update. Um, but I think from when we started work, working on Unreal Engine 4.0, it's now 4.7. I think it's come such a long way. It's Honestly, it's, it's such a good tool now that I don't think we could move away. And I don't think really there's a there's not a viable competitor out there. Right. And um, yeah, I, I think Xbox is Xbox do great great stuff with us. And the idea of Xbox have really sort of given us a platform to make a game. We don't expect anything from them. We don't ever expect them to do our marketing for us or to do our work for us. We just we're just happy that we're able to produce an indie game on Xbox and on console. So they're really good in a way that they make sure we've got the dev kits we need and they make sure we've got the, the dashboard placement we want and they do everything they, within their power to make all this happen. So all of these things together, I think the most amazing thing we've seen throughout this project is that all these huge companies have turned around to, uh, <coughs> to a bunch of 22-year-olds like, and said, hey, well, yeah, we'll help you out, put your game on there. I think that's <laughs> really cool. Yeah, no, that's awesome. That's really awesome. It's, it's funny that you say that because, um, you know, we, we always hear about the issues with the idea Xbox program from from other um, any developers. And, you know, I've spoken to uh, Chris, um, the director of the idea at Xbox program a few times, and he's told me, man, it's it's not really difficult for for people to get their games on the Xbox platform. There's, there's certain, you know, things that you have to do or certain requirements, but all you have to do is give them a call or, or apply. And I, I think it's pretty straightforward or pretty simple. Um, and I'm glad to hear that it, it's been a, a, a easy transition for you guys. I mean, we kind of see a lot of people complain about, you know, Idea Xbox saying, oh, where's my dev kit? You know, you're going to be giving us dev kits. And I think the thing is, it, you know, the dev kits have to come out of somebody's pocket. They're not just give, giving away free Xboxes. That's not what's happening. So mm. it's kind of, they're in a tough situation. Mm. But I think the thing is, if, if your game is really stand out enough and if you keep working on your game like it's a PC build and you show people, you know, you get it out there and you show Microsoft, if they think it's good enough, they'll put it on there. They're not going to turn away from a good game. Right. So they'll, they'll find the money to get you a dev kit and they'll make it happen. If you keep working on your game and you show the right attitude to game development, and it's not that developing for Xbox is easy, it's definitely the easiest it's ever been. 
um, hmm. you know, and, and Charla and the whole team there do a really good job of making sure that developers are happy with what they get. But, you know, I, I think it, it, our thing has always been we leave it down to ourselves to make, make stuff happen. We don't, we don't put our game in their hands, if you know what I mean. We just ask them can you do this for us? Can you do that for us? Right. And uh, from the start, I mean, we never just said, this is a game we want to make. Give us a dev kit. We sent them a full-blown tech demo with a video explaining exactly what, what we want to do in a game design document and, you know, all of our plans and schedules. And we made sure they had everything and we just wanted to give ourselves the best chance and it worked. So it's, it's a two-way street, really. People have to kind of meet halfway. And if anything, you know, the, the developer needs to you know, get a bit further to make them special. So... Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's a good program. And both companies, PlayStation and Xbox, are doing a good job with indies now, so that's good. Yeah, no, that's definitely good to see. More games for gamers and uh, more work for, for you up-and-coming developers, man. You guys are the future, you know? And I, I'm... Yeah, I hope so too, because I would love to do an interview when you when you guys blow up and become, you know, one of the major developers. So, <laughs> you never know. Um, you know, finally, the title Numa Breath of Life must have a meaning behind it considering you play a god exploring reality um with mind melting puzzles and hidden obstacles is there a story behind numa solving each and defeating each obstacle if the game is successful is it possible we may see a sequel and when can we expect numa breath of life to release on the xbox one bunch of questions there so yeah. i'll work backwards again i think um is 27th of February is coming out in oh. uh, you know, Europe. Yeah, I think everywhere in Europe, United States, Mexico, um, Canada, Argentina. Wow. Uh, yeah, basically everywhere in Europe. And at the moment, we're not in Australia. That was the only thing we, mm. the only place we haven't got to yet. But okay. That's maybe some things come in the future. Right. Um, so I think uh, – it's a it's a fair price, nineteen dollars, fifteen pounds, uh, depending on where you live, or nineteen euros, and um, it it yeah, I think that's fair for what it is. I think it, it's a really fun game, and it we didn't want to overcharge for it all. I think at the start we were kind of looking at like Xbox prices, and we thought you know that's, that's actually quite pricey. Right. We decided okay, we'll we'll kind of go lower because you know we want people to buy our game and enjoy it and not feel like they've been robbed ever. So, right. I mean sequels though. Uh, we never say no. It's not not gonna happen, but it's not happening right now. So, right. Um, you know what the future holds. We, don't, we can't really uh, tell right now, but it's 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 not impossible, I guess. Right. Um. Yeah. What was the other question? Um. Is there a campaign to it? Like a story? Is it story driven? Oh yeah, definitely. It's um. The story is actually pretty much fifty percent of it. It's fifty percent story, fifty percent puzzles. Nice. And, um, it's a really, like I said earlier, it's a really good story that it, it can't be told through a film. It can only be told through a video game. Mm. And you have to get to the ending to see that, but it's really, really special. and it, It's something really interesting. And, you know, you, it, the whole story is told by this this, uh, this god's inner monologue and what he's thinking and how he's talking to himself. And at the start, he's quite annoying. And throughout <laughs> the game, you see him mellow out and and yeah, I don't want to give away the ending, but you know, he starts to mellow out and really ponder, I guess. Right. God. So it, it, it gets pretty interesting. And I was actually really impressed with the story when I heard it. I didn't, I thought we were just making a puzzle game and then tagging on a story. But when I spoke to the designer about, you know, his ideas for story, it turned out there was like an awesome story there that we had to put first and then fit the puzzles around the story. And it was, I think it fit perfect. They, nice. they just go together so well that yeah, I think if you can make it to the end of the game, if you're tough enough to stick it out, you'll be really impressed with the ending and it'll definitely be worth your money. So, I think that one of the things that as Xbox gamers, and Xbox gamers in, in particular, um, the things that we would love to see more on, on our platform is more story-driven games. Um and I think that a game like this is something that we need, especially when you have a game that's 50% story, 50% puzzle. And it's not about, you know, boom, 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 explosions and, and things like that. You know, using your mind, your intellect to figure out things and then get a wonderful story behind it and understand what the purpose of everything is going on by the end of the game sounds like a phenomenal 
a phenomenal game in itself and at, at the price you can't beat the price i think it's something that everybody should look into try and and, and definitely pick it up um at the end of the month on, in february yeah i mean we, we don't we don't use any like pre-rendered we don't cheat and use pre-rendered cutscenes or anything in fact there's no cutscenes in the game it's, nice. we tell a story entirely through gameplay you're, you're always in control so i think that it, people really like it and it's worth giving a go uh I just ask people to stick out the puzzles and, you know, uh, use your brain. Don't, don't try and jump your way out of situations. Right. It's, not, it's not how you solve it. Jumping doesn't help. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't, I don't think you need pre-render with a game like this. Not the way it looks already. It, it already looks stunning, you. so you don't you don't need pre-rendering for it. Well, I hope people think so. Yeah, I, I think they'll they'll notice when they, when they see it. <laughs> well, thank you, Joe, uh, for stopping I by. Know, yeah, and, and chatting with us uh, about Numa. We really appreciate it and hope that you'll consider us again for you, for any of your future projects. Yeah, definitely. Well, thank you for having us. No, definitely appreciate it. Reality is that which is observed. As the clock is watched, it counts upwards. As the door is watched, it can be opened. But what happens in a world? where no one's watching. For the fans, by the fans.